back, and this is going to be a really interesting talk, as it always is, uh, as I'm joined by Nicholas Badminton on stage here. Uh, Nicholas is a world-renowned futurist. You may have seen him speak online or in person. He does all sorts of gigs that include, I think one you were telling me recently a few months ago was like 2,000 people in Vegas. Yep. Just a few earlier this year, perhaps. Um, that was last year. I was 2,000 people in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. Oh. Yeah. Just when the primaries were happening as well. So I was, yeah, I was staying in the same hotel as Joe Biden. Nice. Yeah. Wonderful. Interesting times. <laughs> um, and uh, so let's jump into futurism, yep. uh, paint the, the picture of the context, uh, and then we could tell the audience if they're interested in a little bit of news that, you know, something we've been cooking up together. Yep. Uh, and then also, we'll talk about the times and, yeah. and all that jazz. So tell me, just in a nutshell, let's catch everyone up on you know, what futurism is, yep. foresight practice, yep. uh, what you do. Yeah, so I, I, look for <clears throat> I look for signals of change, the things that indicate today, the weak signals and the very obvious signals, the stronger signals that show that the next sort of 5, 10, 20 years are going to be different. Uh, you know, call them trends. Um, talk about predictions maybe, but really talk about building speculative futures. That idea that the future is going to be a particular way, yeah. we can take some evidence of that, bring it back to strategic thinking today, um, mitigation of risk and anticipation. And uh, that, that practice really sort of, it's, it's like strategy on steroids, but looking out to far horizons. And that's what I've been doing for a number of years over and above the strategic thinking and, and technological sort of uh, platforms that I've been building for the last 25 years. Yeah. And about eight years ago when I was running my own events someone called me a futurist and I felt that that was rather strange and as I delved into the area of foresight it was like it was just really what I was already doing uh, just given a name and over the past sort of five six years I've done about 300 keynotes uh, last year yeah Vegas two two and a half thousand people they, I mean these are the times that I really loved and but there's there's one thing that's really interesting I, I sort of knew that the game was up potentially you know i can't rely on speaking to huge audiences all the time one it's tiring sometimes they people want you to fly halfway around the world to go and speak for half an hour and it's not necessarily that sustainable and right. it's not very good um for your health as well really right but uh, I started to diversify into consulting events management also media production as well uh, because i saw the potential of something going awry right and then Earlier this year, my last event was actually in Ottawa for a college down there that was building out its online education capability, which is a very good idea, seeing as what's happening right now. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. One week later, everything shut down, and it was very, very tough times. In this time, we started to look towards like the future of events. All of my work disappeared in a week. Uh, I'm, it's going to come back next year. All of my clients are still booked. I'm still working with lots of speaker agencies. We're moving into virtual speaking as well. Uh, I built myself a, an entire studio at home. I already had half of the gear. And it was kind of surprising to me how I realized that the industry that had been feeding me work and I've been working with and collaborating with was wholly unprepared in every single way. Speaker agencies, great at booking, great at meeting clients' needs, no capability of producing events, virtual events, skills in those areas and whatever. So I've been helping out a lot of agencies thinking about that. Yeah. I've built something called a future casting platform that, that's a completely, you know, I can run it on my own. I've got 4K cameras, I've got high definition audio. I even did a, a presentation on the future of events a few weeks ago for one of my agencies. I've got three or four bookings coming in. I've even used this hybrid event space right, to right. do full presentations. To, to people like the Bank of Canada because they like to see you in these events. And I will be coming back to these places as well, sort of sitting in my studio, yeah. um, showing people you know, what that future could be. Right? So let's talk about, uh, just because I know a lot of people are interested in the technicalities of creating some sort of a streaming solution. Yeah. Uh, I know you've also documented this, so we'll post some links out to people post-event. Yeah. Um, but tell me a little bit about the stack that you put together the stack yeah if, uh, if it's not too extensive the stack to be able to deliver your content in a way that for you as a speaker feels compelling as if as close as you can get to yeah. the, the stage experience of, of looking out at all those people and, and being able to deliver yeah. great nuggets of wisdom yeah. so when the pandemic hit all of these 
other futurists were jumping in front of green screens and it was literally like they were trying to give keynotes from the deck of the Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> or they were standing in front of charts and the slides that they'd normally have projected on the stage. And I was vehemently against it. That's why we were working together to do in, in venue events. And then I realized that you, I can't just turn up and say, Kasim, can I use this 3,000 square foot plus uh, event space? to do a one hour presentation on my own. It's not sustainable for you, for me or whatever. Right. So, so I started to think it's like, okay, I hate green screen, hate these kind of feelings of some of these virtual keynotes. And I realized it was a communications design problem. Mm. So I'm actually working with, uh, with an agency on communications design. Um, we're rebuilding my brand, rebuilding my website. Awesome, awesome people here in Toronto called uh, Field Trip and Company. Alison's the creative director over there. We've been working together and completely rethought how to present information in a way that this, this platform is, before I get into the tech, because sure. that, that, that's whatever, it's magic, it's behind the scenes, it's invisible to the people that, that, that see, uh, see the presentations that I give. You know, how can we take live streaming, something that looks a little bit like esports, something that looks like a documentary? You know, I edit mini documentary videos within larger presentations. Now, it probably takes me 50% 50, 50 longer to put together an online uh, virtual keynote. And clients are asking it for these things to be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Sure, yeah. That's not happening with me. That's actually not happening with a lot of agencies. We, we've kept sort of the integrity. You want something high quality, you get it. Um, you want something that can attract possibly thousands of people to your event, this is the kind of thing. So over the next few months, I'm doing two or three um, really, really quite significant events um, coming up. And, uh, and I actually think that now we've hit September, lots of bookings are gonna start, start pouring in. Behind the scenes, tech. Yeah. I started off with my MacBook, plugged that in, um, just put together an idea of a solution, came back to the, the communications design, great. And then it starts getting really expensive. Luckily, I had a 4K camera, turned that into webcam, great. You know, brand new MacBook Pro, right. you know, you're dropping $4,000 on that. You need that just yeah. to run the video just and to, to run trust these. that everything works. Yeah, the, the hardwire connection from your laptop into your modem so that you've got, you don't have any latency over your home Wi-Fi network. These are, these are things, and you know, we'll share some links on, on, on my full solution. Yep. It's actually been a, a really interesting passage to, to create the solution. What's fascinating about it is as well, I'm still gonna travel around a little bit, gonna go and see some family out west. I can fit everything into a bag, into a backpack, and do it wherever. So it's kind of interesting that, 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 that you can do this, you can build it, it might cost you a few thousand dollars, but every single speaker agency, every single speaker should be doing this. You know, I've seen speakers that are commanding 35, 40, 50 thousand dollars on like terrible webcams sure. or just like the onboard webcams on, on, a, on a Mac. I've seen speaker agencies share video of 480, P. Is yeah, like, what, you were what? mentioning it to Yeah, it, what, what's going on? We live in 2020. I mean, you, the iPhone has got 4K on it. Why, why aren't we just doing this? So a few years ago, I started vlogging and doing all those things. So I came at this sort of already sort of jogging along, really. Right, right. But really, the future of events literally has to be this technical capability, communication design, a completely new way. And we have to revolutionize how we present this content. I mean, very much like you're doing here. I mean, we're surrounded by cameras, there's a production crew, we're in an amazing space. Right. And, and this is it, turnkey, solutions. And, and I think that um, what's happening in the events industry is, you know, these 2,000 people event spaces, like the Bellagio and whatever, you know, you'd roll in the big crews, it'd be amazing production. Yeah. Why, why aren't these turnkey solutions there for, for virtual events in the same way? Right? So one of the first talks today was a dialogue that I had with Don uh, from Tentation. And one of the interesting points he mentioned, at least that stuck out for me, was kind of the idea of, yes, collaboration, leveling the playing field, yeah. and evening out kind of um, getting away from perhaps a competitive mindset. And I think, and hierarchy as well is something he mentioned that is kind of endemic of the events industry. Very interesting to me to hear your kind of story of building a tech stack to be able to produce with such massive um, stage appeal in such a way that is portable, agile, easy, because yeah. it's about collapsing the hierarchy of, yes, the big event that has the budget to be produced in this crazy way versus an intimate experience that um, 
that shouldn't need to kind of suffer in the means of communication. So it's, it's very interesting to say that technology can empower the person who's trying to communicate um, with an audience. Yeah, and, and you know what? It was 12 months ago, almost exactly to the day, that I gave my first you know, high definition 4K uh, streamed uh, virtual keynote. Before the pandemic, before whatever, right. uh, I had some friends from the World Economic Forum that were putting together a conference called Future Explorers. It was in Singapore. And I was like, okay, it costs a lot of money to, to bring me to Singapore. That's 20 to 24 hours travel. That's, that's hotels. That's probably two weeks of, 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 of fee. And, yeah. and, and, and then all the planning. Um, and I said, hey, we'll do this virtually. Easy, dialed in for the, the Q&A as well, um, connected with people. I'm never gonna fly halfway around the world to, to spend 30 minutes on stage. Right, even never. if that comes back, even if people are excited about the sure. industry returning to the normal, I think the new normal, of course, is something that's set by the context. Right? Yeah, and, and why would I do that? I mean, every single event is going to be hybrid. It's going to have virtual components. It's going to be virtual, I think, all the way through 2021. Right. I think we're going to be getting back to normal 2022. The logistics, even if vaccines do come in like Q1 next year, I think the logistics behind it is very, very um, challenging. I, th I think uh, IATA was saying about 8,000 airplanes are going to have to deliver these vaccines around the, around the That's a lot of logistics. That's yeah. not just like two weeks, everyone's vaccinated. Thanks very much. You know, there's production behind it. 2022, we're going to come back, yes. But that new world is going to be hybrid. It's going to be technological. It's going to be virtual. There's going to be lots of virtual experiences. I mean, look at what Travis Scott's been doing with Fortnite. Amazing. Look at what Zwift did with the Tour de France. We could do vir you could partake in the Tour de France. At the time, it was going to be held. It's being held in real life right now. But back then, you know, hundreds of thousands of people could participate in the Tour de France. And they brought in the professional riders to ride virtually. Look at these kinds of experiences. Another, ex another just like simple ways of connecting online. Uh, the Quarantine Book Club was, was something that was run by Mike Montero and his team. And you could meet and chat in an intimate setting with your favorite authors. Mm. that were provocative you know it's a couple of hundred people on each of the sessions like easy enter enter to get into it like five ten dollars fifteen dollars yeah. to get into it and then even mark rebella like going to drive-in theaters 12 shows eight theaters i think it was down in texas or mm. certainly down that way uh, half a million dollars in revenue you know this is it like the, the game's been changed now what we have to do is the spaces, the agencies, the speakers all have to change as well. I, I'm ahead of the, the curve. I've been experimenting. I'm not going to stop experimenting. I think that's what p really challenges people. And that future is experimentation. It, it, it is sort of breaking the boundaries. Right. And it's going to be very uncomfortable for many people that have been stuck in this traditional industry. Definitely. Definitely. It yeah. is, unfortunately, um, this context is demanding evolution and the impetus for innovation in how everyone looks at what they do is, is there, is, is unquestionable. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting because the producers, I know a lot of people that are here um, with us virtually today yeah. are event planners and producers. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, I know you're speaking from the speaker's perspective, yeah. from a content production um, you know, perspective as well, but from the event production that surrounds it typically, how are you seeing, um, through your engagements, how are you seeing events come together in hybrid space? Yeah, so uh, we, we never used to do technical rehearsals until I was sort of on the ground. Right. Even if there was going to be a virtual event, you know, we'd do, do a, a little bit of a check, but it'd be okay. We'd trust that the technology works. Now, it, the, the preparation, you know, a week before we get together, you probably spend one to two hours with your client. I need to run through, I need to make sure that all of my tech is working to connect to their platforms. You know, I, I even worked with the client earlier this year, and I think Skype for Business had a restriction. If, if you were using a Mac, it would time out after 40 minutes. Oh my God. 
but we found it, we fixed it, we took care of it, right? Yeah, right. So, so you have to get into it and you have to be prepared. You know, it's, I don't need a green room. I don't need like, you know, the pastries and the, uh, the tea and coffee on the side. I just need to know that it's all, gonna, it's all gonna come together, that they can facilitate what they need to facilitate. They can create some kind of excitement around the event and connection between myself and their people, and their, their attendees. And you know what, some of the best events that I've worked with have just got really, really skilled production team that know what they're doing and are failovers as well. So I do a full 4K uh, recording of my entire keynote before, the before every single keynote that I do. And I send them a high definition version of that. Internet goes down, power goes off, anything like that. There's the link. It's time coded. They go straight into where I was in the presentation. Maybe one minute disruption tops. Like life goes on, right? right. Uh, so, you know, it's more work. But, you know, if, if you want to be part of this game, you've got to work hard, right? And that's always been my philosophy anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's take a, a, a kind of side angle on this. Uh, talk a little bit more about foresight. Yeah. Uh, and your practice yeah. uh, specifically applied to this context. So I know a little while ago you were telling me that, and even in this talk, you were talking about the timelines typically that you work with yeah. with clients as being uh, perhaps mo years is normally the framework. Yeah, 5, 10, 20 years. I, I've even started writing speculative fiction for the year 2220. So 200 years into the future. I just released a, a short story on Medium earlier uh, called Jocasta. I've had it sort of in, in my files for like five years, sort of nervous that, you know, chapter one's gonna come out, like, and then you get over it. A friend of mine just published one of his, his short stories, which really was the impetus for, for me to do that about four o'clock this morning, oh. you know, being up and being sort of focused in on trying to work out how to balance being a new father and getting some work done. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Um, but, but what's really interesting uh, uh, about this is, yes, we have to look further. And people, you know, if we can look out 20 years, and we can create an idea of what that future could be, then we can bring evidence back from that narrative. That, that, that we can start saying, you know, what if the future is different? And right. I always say, moving our, shifting our mindset from what is to what if. What if that future is different? And how can we prepare for it today? And strategically, what can we put in place? Yeah. We might not be able to invent magical technologies that, that might exist in the future. That's not what I do. I work with clients to work out, you know, how's your relationships gonna be? How are people feeling about you and your brand? What products do you feel people are gonna want? You know, what's this new ecosystem going to be in 20 years time where there's a backbone of trillions of sensors and data and automation or whatever, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and what does that, that human condition look like in that situation? And you know, I, I've done virtual workshops um, through the pandemic. I've advised trillion dollar companies, uh, central banks and really gone into it. And you know, when you can look out, people feel a little bit more confident because they can be creative. Yeah. And, and bring some of those ideas to the table that, you know, they're not worried about the next three months, six months, 18 months. So, uh, so that they can really focus in on coming up with something that's a bold vision, bigger strategic thinking, and, and really anticipating the risks. For example, the pandemic. No one anticipated this. Mass industrial complex failure. Right. Every government around the world, even people like Singapore that, that had to deal with SARS, yeah, they were fairly quick, like Taiwan was fairly quick. China just shut everything down, totalitarian state style, right? Um, and, but no one, no one's prepared. Mm -hmm. How many pandemics do you think there's been just in, since 1900? Right. You know, beyond the Spanish flu, many, many pandemics. And there's gonna be one pandemic a decade. That's what I'm predicting. Yeah. So how are we gonna prepare in the future? We're not just gonna shut everything down, we're gonna build resiliency. So that's what I help people do. I build resiliency, I, I take them into something that could be quite a, an affronting future, a scary future, and give them confidence to make decisions today. So that, you know what, if we would have had PPE, if we would have had protocols in place, if we would have had like international collaboration, yeah, that was a big one. The we, 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 we would have avoided all of this. Is that all going to be put in place in the next five years? Absolutely it will be. I mean, people know the decisions that they need to make now. I mean, I think it was Fauci that was saying it took about a month to two months for this pandemic to travel around the planet. Typically, it's like six to nine months of other kinds of, of pandemics as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, responsiveness and agility 
and uh, community effort yep. at all levels, um, you know, builds the resiliency. Uh, let's take a quick lens, if you're willing to, to wing it, uh, on the events industry. Yes. And give me whatever, give us whatever uh, you can in terms of um, some tips on how people can apply foresight yeah. to divining a future for themselves. Uh, within, the, in, within the context of events. Yeah, I think perhaps our listeners would enjoy that as, as event planners and producers. Okay, the thing that I love about the events industry is that it's a creative industry and people can completely rethink the human experience. Right. Right. We could get together. Yeah. You know, I was just I was just on, on a call with someone in the UK from an agency over there. And, you know, they say, you know, we, we normally book musical acts and, and big like warehouse venues and acrobats and food and all of this. Yeah. Right? Cool. But now they're like, yeah, we're building up our virtual capabilities. What can you do? Oh, it's a Burning Man yeah. was just completely reimagined to be in, in alt, alt VR, alt oh, space, I think, okay. alt space VR. Um, I mean, this is what people can do, completely reimagine how things could be. I think events are going to go from like those two, three days a year mm. to 365, all the content. It, 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 it blows my mind how many events I've been to where they don't record the sessions. Yes. I mean, some of them are security events and you don't record sure. the session. If it's a private but thing. If it's a private thing, Chatham House rules, I get it. Yeah. it. But the majority of the events that I go to, I'd say maybe 10% record in very high quality and I've got that available. You know, I've done 300 keynotes the last five, six years. And out of that, I've probably had like 15, maybe 20 high definition, you know, client provided uh, video. Yeah. What's going on? I mean, we live in a world of content. We live in a world where continual engagement is going to be the way of the future. Why aren't we even thinking about that like 10 years ago? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, we're surrounded here by four or five different cameras. I find it fascinating yeah. to consider that as in the last five years with the ridiculous rise of social media, particularly, yeah. you know, the majors, right? Um, anyone, though, that broadcasts video, particularly, yeah. you know, Instagram, Facebook, etc., the family of Facebook. Um, people are watching more and more shorter and shorter videos. Yeah. Typically, uh, people will watch an aggregate longer playtime than a movie a day in North America. In the States, it's like three times what yeah. we watch or something, pre-pandemic, um, made up of small, small, small videos. Yeah. So the narratives are crazy. There's so many narratives happening in an hour for someone. Yeah. Uh, and they're watching all this content in such a dense way. Um, you know, one societal output of this, of course, is patience for narrative is changing. Cinematographers are considering this. It's funny because right now we haven't really talked about it yet today, but uh, the Toronto Film Festival, yeah. which is in its hybrid format, um, is, I believe, starting today. Uh, and normally this is a time when the whole city is abuzz with activity. Right. No one even knows a TIFF is happening right. uh, because everyone's at home or, uh, or the advertising isn't in the streets because, hey, you can't go to a film screening. Yeah. So, but regardless, um, my feedback that I've had from the film industry is very much that um, in crafting narratives looking forward now, uh, people are considering shorter timelines, snippets, or, or, or um, I guess multi-part narratives, yeah. and breaking cinema into different interactive pieces. Yeah. Um, but I find it very interesting to just say that, you know, in this kind of format, like talks, uh, authentic dialogue between people. Typically, the format delivered, um, you know, at in fireside chats and panel discussions uh, at events um, yeah. that we all put on in the corporate arena. This kind of like depth of knowledge being exchanged live in an authentic format yeah. is necessarily going to be medium to long format. If it's snippety, it's in the post edit. So, it's interesting to say that this may be one of the last formats. Uh, or most compelling formats to capture people's imaginations if they're interested. The power of conversation through video. And I think that that's a very powerful thing. I say this uh, as um, you know, a compelling argument to anyone watching considering you know, motivation. I know it's tough to motivate yourself when considering why should I produce something, not many people are gonna tune in, there's so much noise on the internet. You know, one person who listens to something for an hour is maybe worth 10 people who watch the 10 minutes of that hour. 
um, and that's something to consider. It's absolutely true. And I always, <laughs> I think I've got about 500 like subscribers on YouTube. And you know, I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing as long as they're the right 500 people. I'll tell you a story. So uh, to you, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was in Morocco, right? Fa fabulous, in Marrakesh. Mm. I was on the rooftop of the place I was staying and I got an email from a guy called Yusuf Nassif um, from Germany and uh, Egyptian guy, uh, like very, very well respected guy, director of adaption, United, United Nations uh, climate change uh, organization. Yep. Directorate. And he said, I watched your video. Like my video was like 50 minutes long. Mm. And uh, within three months, I was in South Korea giving the opening keynote. It was only 15 minutes, ironically, <laughs> to 100 people for a design charrette, for five-day design charrette around resiliency and climate change, right? So I think that you're absolutely right. The long form yeah. is not going to change. I, and I really compel you know, any, any serious event producers to not think, you know, 15-minute chunks, you know, consumable. I think it waters it down. I don't think it delivers what people want. I think people want to go deeper. I think, you know, the TED, the TEDx format. Sure. It's dying on the vine. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's like, okay, you know, it, it's formulaic. Yeah. Longer form lets you break out the formula. I do custom keynotes for every single client. I do research. I give them research reports after my keynotes. You know, the amount of keynote speakers that I know that give the same information that you can watch right. on YouTube right. and you pay potentially thirty-five, fifty thousand dollars to have them on stage. Yeah. It's, 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 it doesn't serve the events industry yeah. and it doesn't actually do them justice either. I think everyone needs to step up and start working harder from a content pr perspective to maintain that long form. That long form needs to be interesting and it needs to be varied. And I think that every single part of the events industry needs to ensure that. I've run events where I, I, I get people to sign and agree that they will put together specific content for the event that they haven't spoken about before. Guarantee the originality. Absolutely. And yeah. the authenticity and the spontaneity yeah. of the moment. And that's experience of that is magic at events. That's right. The, I think it's interesting. I think there's also something in what you said, which is making the content available, right? Like that chap wouldn't have contacted you if you hadn't seen that video on YouTube, if the yeah. video was in some private uh, behind a password or something. And so I think that's also a lesson for corporations and for corporate bodies who are producing content that's right. for internal digestion. Um, there's a massive upside to embracing collaboration with people who may, you may not know to invite to an audience. I think opening up what the audience is, of course there's ticketing you know, concerns for people planning events, but if your revenues are not necessarily only driven from ticket sales, which yeah. I think everyone has to embrace as a reality today, um, this huge upside to opening up the content, making it available, That's right. and lowering the bar to that availability. Um, and then, it, it actually, I think it does, that has a sort of symbiotic relationship with enabling quality content in a quality format. You know, people will engage in it better. And you don't need to just find those five people that love it. You know, just make it available to everybody. And of that, everybody, there will be that audience. And share it and syndicate it and get people who really do love it to, to share it with their friends, you know? You know, transcribe everything. Put that into blog posts. Yeah, you that's know, a whole other thing, exactly. Turn like it into search audio. engine, find it. Yeah, turn it into audio, put it into a podcast, start a podcast. Yeah. Like, why aren't we doing this? And the first podcast I did was um, contacting musicians from around the world on MySpace, huh. right? Drum and bass musicians yeah. and electronica musicians. Yeah. This was like 16, 17 years ago, maybe even, even uh, further away than that, to share their music. It was, it was a little bit more tricky to do it back then. It, it's easy now. I've, I, I've got my Exponential Minds podcast. We're going to be doing some work together. I do vlogging, whatever. You know this is not difficult. I, I, it just occurred to me that's how we met. Yeah. So we met. That's right. Because Startwell on campus here, we have a professional podcast studio. It's used by everyone from independents and startups to the CBC. And one of the media outlets that uses it is called Betakit. Uh, I believe it's betakit.com. For anyone interested, uh, Canada's premier breaking news source for uh, innovation news, startup news. And uh, Douglas uh, Saltis, the editor-in-chief, had right. you in studio. That's right. And I swung by that room, and when you were coming out or going in, it was like, hey, hi. <laughs> yeah. And so 
It, you know, absolutely. Podcasting is powerful, and of course, in this hybrid context, at least here on campus, where yeah. people are producing content together, yeah. if not at the same time, uh, the opportunity for um, kind of content to connect people yeah. is, is powerful. And I think uh, as well the the context of space. Because it was that time, I was living in Vancouver, I moved to Toronto a year ago. Right. And that was two and a half years ago. And you said, you can come and use this space whenever you're in Toronto. And I think that, that, that that's something that I'm thankful for, so thank you. And, and now I've, I've continued working, working here and I'm now working with you. And I think that that's what we need to do with the events industry as well, is open the doors yes. and, and become accessible as people and event spaces and whatever. So to that end, that's actually core to the, um, you know, the ethics to be honest, of Startwell, of mm. my company, of this place where we are at today. Um, and we'll prepare something to actually introduce Startwell to everyone post the session today. Uh, so you can kind of like tour the whole campus and get a sense of where we are and what we do. But like, let's paint this whole picture. We met two and a half years ago when you were on campus being interviewed in our podcast studio. Yeah. Uh, formed a friendship, try to work on how we can collaborate. Once you moved here, you started using Startwell as your home base for your work. Uh, and through serendipitous conversations, we're now, I think today, we can announce that we're actually forming um, Canada's first residency program for futurists. Yeah. The future in resident, Futurist in Residency program at Startwell. Um, it might even be North America. Let's just say it's the world. Yeah. It's the first one in the world. I don't actually, no, I, I, it's true. I, they're, great, um, they're great institutions, OCAD here in Toronto for, for foresight practitioners and whatever. Yeah. But in terms of incubators, like co-working spaces, I don't know of any, so yeah. So our goal is through the program, from my angle at least, to enable the transmission of values, ethics, um, methodology, and so on um, between all peoples engaged in innovation and innovative work here on campus with foresight and with uh, this whole pursuit of futurism. That's right. And at the same time, develop hopefully, um, you know, the talents of aspiring young futurists to take up the helm um, and work with Nick uh, and also have a carte blanche with our organization to use whatever facilities and whatever knowledge, whatever access to network that they want to be able to uh, pursue, uh, whether it's a career or just an interest in futurism. And it's really interesting hearing your experience lately because in the last six months, let's say, because I think it's, it's easy to say now um, that the world needs more futurists. People need to understand the way to think yeah. about cues towards what tomorrow brings. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And, yeah, me too. And it was cool that uh, everyone's here today for us to be able to let them know that this is happening. Yeah. Futurists are hope engineers. Oh, I like that. Yeah, we're, we're optimists. We have to be optimistic. I, I mean, I run other events that, that look at the darker times, like dark futures, but ultimately we're optimists. People do not need to see into a dystopia. Right. They need, to, they need to see into we've something. We've done that enough in the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've been staring it in the face. I woke up this morning and stared, stared dystopia in the face again. You know, you sort of doom scroll through, uh, through Twitter and the such like. <laughs> but, but yeah, we're, we're, we're hope engineers. And do you know what? The entrepreneurs that work here, the events that we do, we'll do dark futures here, we'll do uh, future camp here, and we'll put together meetups, and we'll do a whole bunch of different things, and it's going to be very exciting. I think that that is going to be great. And when futurists come into town, They've got somewhere to come and talk to us. Absolutely. It's a community. And that's what really gets people thinking. And that's what really connects people. I mean, it's why I started my podcast, started vlogging, do media, come here, doing events like this, is because we need this energy. Well, this energy is going to hold the industry together from an events perspective, and it's going to propel it to the next level. We're certainly a hybrid campus for <clears throat> all types of engineers, including hope engineers, to like work and there you go. thrive. You yeah, know? absolutely. Um, so it was a pleasure to be able to let people know this Thank and you. to chat. Um, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, hearing from Nick. Uh, Nick, you want to shout out any uh, things coming up that you have, any links for people to be able to learn more about you, what you uh, prophesize, what yeah. you divine, 
uh, and how they can contact you? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm on CTV in Canada every month in Future Fridays. It's typically the first or second Friday of every month. Uh, I'm going to be on The Social next month. Oh, nice. Which is kind of exciting. So, yeah. so you can you can look out for me there at um, some, some point, I think October the 16th, 17th. Cool. Uh, so, so, yeah, uh, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm on radio, I'm on Sirius XM with Jeff Sammer on Canada Now. There's a whole bunch of things that I do. You can, you can check out what I'm doing at nicholasbadminton.com. Reach out to me at LinkedIn, Twitter. You'll find me on Twitter, Nicholas Badminton. There's only one of me in the world with this spelling. <laughs> that you found so There's far. another guy called Nick Badminton in South Africa. He looks you, very different to you me. You haven't discovered the end of the dystopia of, you know, the pandemic. There no. may be a, a whole community of Nicholas Badmintons thriving in rural Burundi. Yeah, and this might only be a simulation. Who knows?